Okay. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Emerging Conversations 2020. Um, we are really excited for our conference today, and we're very, very glad that you're all here to join us. Um, I'm going to get started with some opening remarks, and then um, we'll move into our keynote panel. Um, Welcome. Please be aware that the event is being recorded. However, the only the presenters videos will be seen on the recording. So those of you um, who are viewing as part of our audience, your video will not be recorded. You are welcome to turn off your video or take any other steps you deem necessary to feel most comfortable here today. Thank you for taking time out of your weekend to join us. While this year has been and certainly continues to be challenging in many ways, it has offered us the exciting opportunity to expand this symposium through a digital format. This may well be the most diverse emerging conversations ever in terms of universities, museums, programs, and research areas represented by our speakers and by all of you attending today. We have a very exciting program planned today, but before we get started, I'd like to say a few words. My name is Kaylee Cazera. I'm a doctoral student from the University of Arizona Art and Visual Culture Education Program in Tucson, Arizona, and I'm one of the co-organizers this year. Tucson and the university sit on the lands of the Tahana Otham and Pascuayaki peoples. The Tahana Otham and Pascuayaki peoples have both sovereign nation status and have contemporary nation lands with formal boundaries in and near Tucson but their traditional and ancestral territories extend well beyond these borders. We also recognize the lands of Tucson were once part of the territory of Mexico, taken by the United States through militarized expansionism. That the university is a state land grant institution then means that those privileged to be educated here and work here directly benefit from these territorial injustices. We hope that acknowledging these truths will lead to reconciliation. Emerging Conversations is an annual symposium organized by graduate students in the Art and Visual Culture Education Program at the U of A. The 2020 Planning Committee members can be found in our program. We will be providing the link to this in the chat and it is also available on our website. Thank you to the committee for your hard work and collaboration this year. The symposium was first organized in 2012. It changes and grows each year. This year, the global pandemic presented our planning committee with numerous challenges, one of which being holding the symposium in an entirely virtual format for the first time ever. This online format, though, brings with it exciting possibilities. It has allowed us to bring together a larger group of presenters, many of whom come from outside of our small University of Arizona community. This group includes graduate students, university professors, community practitioners, and many more. Among our presenters are also practitioners outside the field of art education who share common visions and goals for the future of the arts, education, and the humanities during this uncertain time. Today's symposium consists of 10 concurrent live speaker sessions, four pre recorded sessions, and a keynote panel. The Zoom links you received when you registered will be open continuously throughout the day. We have structured the sessions so there are breaks in between as we know it can be draining to be on Zoom for extended periods of time. The final session will conclude at 2.30 p.m. Following this, we will have a 30-minute happy hour networking session. We hope you'll stick around and join us for some informal connection and conversation. The sessions will be recorded and uploaded to our YouTube channel, so they will be available to you later if you wish to revisit any of them. The sessions will also be closed captioned. Our four pre-recorded sessions are currently available on our YouTube for streaming, and the sessions from today will be available in about two weeks on our YouTube. The theme for this year's Emerging Conversations is Revision and Re-Envision, the Future of Art Education in Uncertain Times. 2020 has been a year of monumental change and of great uncertainty. Our world looks very different today than it did just seven months ago. We continue to see the effects of a global pandemic, of racial injustices, natural disasters, and more that I'm likely forgetting. Like much during this time, these frightening and earth-shattering events have brought significant physical, emotional, financial, and spiritual challenges to each of us. However, these uncertain times also hold within them great opportunity for growth and for change. 
Thank you all again for your time and your conscious choice to spend a Saturday here with us in conversation. We will begin with our keynote panel. Our panel consists of artists, educators, and researchers who are all working in interesting and unique ways to create a more accessible, inclusive, and just future in the arts, education, and humanities. The panel includes Dr. Sandrine Hahn, an Associate Professor of Art Education at the University of British Columbia. Dr. Hahn's research focuses on the ways in which media have influenced cultures, how people learn from the visualized virtual world, and how educators can use the gaming world as an educational tool for both academic and vocational education. Dr. Brian Carter, Director of the Center for Digital Humanities and Associate Professor of Africana Studies at the University of Arizona. Dr. Carter specializes in African American literature of the 20th century with a primary focus on the Harlem Renaissance. His research also focuses on digital humanities and Africana studies. His research centers on how the use of traditional and advanced interactive and immersive technologies changes the dynamic within the learning space. Dr. Carter is the creator of Virtual Harlem, an immersive representation of Harlem, New York, as it existed in the 1920s Jazz Age and Harlem Renaissance. Raven Ruffin, a community arts organizer and digital storyteller whose work makes art accessible online and in real life for and by women and communities of color. Raven is co-founder and community manager at Brown Art Inc. and a public programs fellow at the Studio Museum in Harlem and the Museum of Modern Art and Eli Burke, an educator and artist. Eli's research and museum programming focuses on the queer imaginary, intergenerational learning, access, empathy, and vulnerability. His artwork focuses on magic, mystery, vulnerability, empathy, transness, queerness, the body, abstraction, and agency. Eli is the education director at the Museum of Contemporary Art Tucson and is a doctoral student in the art and visual culture education program. Thank you to all of our panelists for joining us today. More detailed biographies of each of the panelists is available in the program. Our panel will be moderated by Dr. Gloria Wilson, Assistant Professor of Art and Visual Culture Education at the University of Arizona. Dr. Wilson's research is situated in the fields of cultural studies, black studies, and critical pedagogy. She is an artist, public scholar, and qualitative arts-based methodologist. Her work highlights the intersections of racial identity and arts participation, analyzing how cultural systems work to produce race and racism in general, and more specifically, examines constructions of racial representations in and across creative modalities, and how these practices and processes work to reinscribe or refuse these hegemonic systems. Thank you, Dr. Wilson, for serving as moderator this morning. I'd like to welcome our panel and Dr. Wilson to begin their conversation at this time. Thank you again for joining us this morning. Thank you so much, Kaylee, for that welcome. I'd first like to start by thanking the Emerging Conversations organizers um, for your tireless efforts uh, in organizing this annual event and for also inviting me to moderate this keynote dialogue. Gia, Amber, Kaylee, Lucy, Rachel, and Andrew. I know that each of you has spent countless hours in planning, working to address unforeseen challenges, losing hours of sleep, and probably wishing at points along the way that you could just quit. Well, your efforts have brought all of us here today. You have provided a space for the possibility of what might emerge out of the fissures that 2020 has exposed. This particular moment in time, the current and ongoing unrest across communities around the globe and the ruptures that this unrest has caused in our lives, including the day-to-day -day attending of classes, teaching classes, working full-time, taking care of family and friends. I commend each of you for organizing what I know will be a dynamic set of conversations and presentations today. I'm also excited to have a dialogue with each of our four invited keynote speakers, Eli Burke, Dr. Brian Carter, Dr. Sandrian Han, and Raven Ruffin. 
in learning more about each of you and your work in relationship with the world of the visual. I think also about how your work extends practices and processes of teaching and learning. So the culture of education is what I'm speaking about here. Each of you and each of us here today also have connections to an expansive art and visual culture education, which is mediated in a variety of ways. We are consumers and sometimes producers of this dynamic cultural practice and process. So what does it mean to take part in this process? To be situated along a historical continuum of being educated by and by extension, consciously or unconsciously educating others within and through and about the silences, the gaps, and presently a noxious political climate. As the theme for this symposium suggests, a revision or re-envisioning of art and visual culture education within the context of these uncertain times that we live needs to be considered. How might we then proceed under these conditions, this climate, this atmosphere? I'd like for us to think with the words of Toni Morrison, who I believe kept close watch of the turbulences of the world and the totality of this environment during her time here in the material world. In December of 2004, she wrote of a different troubling time, and this was during the re-election of George W. Bush. In her writing, she alluded to the notion that the artist is both a grounding and elevating force during turbulent times. Quote, this is precisely the time when artists go to work. There's no time for despair, no place for self-pity, no need for silence, no room for fear. We speak, we write, we do language. That is how civilizations heal. Morrison also writes about the practice and process of artists. I'd like for us to also imagine James Baldwin in conversation with Miss Tony when he wrote almost 60 years ago about the creative process in 1962. Quote, there are forever swamps to be drained, cities to be created, mines to be exploited, children to be fed. None of these things can be done alone. But the conquest of the physical world is not man's only duty. He is also enjoined to conquer the great wilderness of himself. The precise role of the artist then is to illuminate that darkness, blaze roads through that vast forest so that we will not in all of our doing lose sight of its purpose, which is after all, to make the world a more human dwelling place." End quote. And also, quote, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. End quote. Toni Morrison reminds us that even within the ruins, something new must emerge. And it's often the creatives who imagine this possibility. The challenge that James Baldwin presents to us is not only that we must examine the larger ecosystem, or in the case of this symposium, provide vision or re-envision of the future of art and education but that what we must also examine ourselves as creatives existing within this ecosystem who constitute what is and what can be considered an art education and what practices and processes might emerge amidst uncertainty. When I think of the work each of you, our keynote speakers do, Eli and Dr. Brian Carter and Dr. Han and Raven, I see natural connections to the notion of futurity across your work. And so in bringing these things together, the notion of uncertainty, when it feels like everything might fall to pieces at any given moment, our state of minds, our institutions, for instance, but also the notion of the imagination. 
as provided by creatives, educators, and researchers such as yourself. So I open with this question for our dialogue. How are each of you currently thinking about and with your work in relation to the visual, to education, and to this notion of futurity? I can all also copy and paste this question in the chat. I'm happy to jump in. Um, one of the quotes you shared, I mean, they're all really amazing. And first of all, I just want to say thanks to everyone for being here and also thanks for inviting me to be part of the conversation. I'm really excited. Um, but those were really powerful quotes and one of them in particular really kind of instantly made a connection for me, um, which was really interesting. Um, not everything that is child, what, what was the quote? Not everything, the James, sorry. Not everything faced. Can be changed, yes. But nothing yes. until it is faced. Yes, that quote. Um, it, one of the things that I've been focusing on is intergenerational learning and connections within the LGBTQ community. Um, and I think right now, um, one of the things that was highlighted for me in our current time, which I started this work before all of this began or like really at the beginning in 2017, um, is realizing that there's a lot of um, gaps within groups. Um, so within the queer community itself, um, there's a lot of misunderstanding um, across generations. And I think that healing within um, is like, for me, I see that as the first step because I think until we're divided, I mean, until we're united, um, you know, we can't really, how do we collectively do the work? So I just want to, I'm just throwing that out. There's a starting point, but that's sort of one of the ways that I, I think we need to attend to um, our communities. Um, and I also think a focus on care um, within our communities so that we can kind of unite. I think there's a lot of compartmentalized groups that are rather than facing the larger thing can get caught up in like battling each other. Um, so for me, that intergenerational aspect of healing across generations um, and actually just exposing those things within our own groups that we maybe don't want to look at um, can become a starting point for healing. And then we can come together and really look at these really horrific things that are outside of us, um, are challenging us. Uh, so I'll just, I'll leave that there. I can go ahead and tag myself in if that's all right. Um, also, thank you all for being here, for you morning, for me afternoon. <laughs> so thank you for getting up on Saturday. Um, and also thank you for having me and I'm excited to be in conversation with you all. Um, and thank you, Dr. Wilson, for that beautiful framework that you provided. Um, always Toni Morrison, right? But I also um, so appreciate that James Baldwin, as you were talking about Toni Morrison, I immediately thought of that conversation. And so I'm glad you touched on that as well, because I think what's pertinent and what James Baldwin was talking about was the artist is despised, right, in society up until um, usually we, we honor them in their death. But in that, in that piece, he's talking about how the artists throughout their work, right, as they're challenging society, is despised. Um, and in some ways, I'm thinking about how in this moment, uh, we've been working towards this. You spoke about how all of our work on this panel um, is about filling a, type, a, type, a, excuse me, a type of gap. Um, and so in filling those gaps, right, we've been working towards this undoing. And so I see myself in the way that I've worked in support of artists, right? Working alongside artists um, to help them sustain themselves, um, helping to kind of undergird an artistic ecosystem that is sustainable for them um, throughout their careers, that this is the kind of moment that we've been working towards, a kind of undoing of these institutions um, in the many landscapes that we're all um, working, working through. Um, so I think for me, 
and, and this is similar to Eli, right? Like there were already these kinds of networks that were there. And I think because of this undoing that's happening in this moment, we're seeing the way that these networks are kind of bubbling to the surface, right? Um, so many of these networks aren't new, uh, but the visibility has changed, right? Um, and so thinking about in terms of futir futurity, um, how do we then preserve those networks um, to Eli's point, right? And, and acknowledge those networks, but also preserve them um, in a way that, again, is just sustainable and less relying on those, those systems, right, that continue to be undone and, and have shown us that they aren't sustainable. Thank you, Eli and Raven. Uh, Dr. Hahn or Dr. Carter, feel free to jump in. Well, thank you, Dr. Hahn. And, and first of all, thank you all very much for allowing me to be a part of this conversation. And like, like all the others have echoed, uh, Dr. Wilson, your, your introduction was amazing. I, I love both of those artists. And uh, I, I really believe that that part of what we're talking about here with relationship to my work uh, is really that of uh, experiential uh, and immersion. Uh, when I think about the ways that we're able to experience uh, uh, black pain and, uh, and some of the things that are happening in our current situation, and the ways that uh, that James Baldwin sought to figure out what was going on with some of the uh, the levels of racism during the early 1960s through some of his work. Um, I think that we're now at a point technologically where we can begin to merge some of those aspects. And and we're, we're really moving into a very interesting realm with regards to being able to immerse people into a period in time uh, or into a moment where it almost feels as if they're there. And uh, being able to experience that on another level is going to hopefully uh, I cause um, I reason for some very drastic changes to occur. Okay, I guess this is my turn now. Um, thank you for having me. Uh, I'm Sandri, and uh, I thank you to the um, Gloria's uh, introduction and uh, great uh, starting of this uh, presentation. Um, uh, this keynote speaking, and um, I, uh, what I want to say is what. Before this pandemic, before all this, uh, before this year, I'm very much into the technology and then thinking about technology. However, since this pandemic, it's turned me around. I'm not only thinking about technology, but I think the humanity become even more important during this time. We have technology in our hand. We are using it right now, but where are we going from here? Um, what is the education that's the goal that we really have? Where do you, we want to go from here to, to the next? Uh, where is the next? I think that's my biggest question. Um, if we want to envision or re-envision our future, should we have a goal? Should we know where we are going? Um, when I'm thinking about where we are going, the place I'm thinking is maybe we should have focusing on the humanity more than the technology. So this is where I start with all this thinking. Um, yeah, I actually did a, a small presentation, a PowerPoint that lists a lot of questions. I, I'm more a person who ask questions than answering the questions. So I have a lot of questions list on a PowerPoint presentation I uploaded to the uh, conference uh, Google Drive. So if anyone would are is interested in knowing the questions that I have and maybe have a conversation with me, um, yeah, please feel free to check it out. Yeah, because I think before we go further, maybe we need to know where are we going? And I guess that's it for now. Thank you. Can I, can I add something there? Sorry, um, if that's okay. Um, that's a really great comment. And I'm thinking about your, in your question, you talk about the no notion of futurity. And one of the things that I'm really invested in is the, the idea of the imaginary and the idea that uh, you know, we we must imagine 
and in order to create that future that we seek. Um, but the things that arise for me when I ask that question are what we can imagine, but then also, um, uh oh, I think I froze. Can you hear me? Sorry, can you hear me? Okay, I'll just keep talking and hope that you can hear me. Um, sorry, my internet is not great. Um, but thinking about the, the imagination in, in terms of who we are affects what we can imagine, but then also um, who is able to realize those imaginings and the systems that affect you know, what we have access to and, and all the things we already know and understand. But, so I would love to say that imagination is the only part of the key, but there's so many more layers to even that. Were you able to hear that at all? Yes. Can you can you hear me? Okay, sorry. Yes. Sorry, my internet is terrible. It's okay. Um, oh, I'm surprised, you know, I've heard others say it also. I'm surprised the internet has not just completely broken. Um, <laughs> So you're good. Yes. Um, thank you all for these um, these responses. And you bring up um, some, you know, both unique points and also points of convergence. And uh, Dr. Han, I feel it's particularly interesting your question of um, where do we want to go, and also um, the point that you bring up about your work um, centralizing technology in many ways, but that maybe the pendulum is swinging back the other way and we're reminded that um, the human element, um, there's something to be said about that. Uh, and it sounds like uh, this moment has been instrumental in sort of shifting your thinking about this. And so I kind of want to extend that um, into our conversation and ask uh, the other speakers um, how has your work shifted? Uh, how have you had to revision, um, revise, um, re-envision the work that you do under our current moment? I'll pop in here because uh, part of my response is to Dr. Han as well, because uh, part of the answer, and there's no one single answer to the many questions I'm sure you have, uh, but part of that uh, answer is through the digital humanities. When you think about how the digital humanities not only uh, centers the human element in everything uh, and, the, and the conversations emanate from there, uh, but we also embrace the technology and, and, and help to shape its direction. So when you're asking the question, where are we going? Uh, in many cases, and, and I can point to so many examples, in many cases it's been humanists who have predicted, uh, forecasted, or even um, imagined uh, these future technologies, uh, but with the human in mind as they evolve. So when I think about how my research has, has focused on that, uh, Dr. Wilson, I look at uh, not only how immersive education has come online and particularly because of the pandemic has uh, become even more front and center than it was in, in the mid-2000s when everyone was gathering at a place called Second Life, for some of you that remember that old place. Um, but, but when I also think about how, in addition to immersion, uh, we have to then uh, critically analyze those who have access to uh, the various technologies that we're that we're looking at. You know, maybe uh, forecasting or prophesizing, or that are that are even in place now. Once again, centering the human on all of those conversations. Um, I look at um, uh, how my work has has also expanded into Afrofuturism because when you think about uh, the the importance of looking at where we've been in addition to where we are, where we're going, and there and the blurring of the line between all of those those uh, planes of existence, uh, along with. Dr. Wilson, getting to your point, the social justice mission that incorporates all of that plus the technology, there's where I think when we think about the expanding definition of Afrofuturism, it really does fit to this moment. It introduces students to uh, levels of, of uh, in conversations related to Afrofuturism that they didn't even 
even though existed when they were first exposed to the movie Black Panther and got all excited about Afrofuturism, right? So I think that it's important that we that we embrace the moments, uh, whatever they may be. And that includes the technology, but it also includes uh, the social and racial dynamics that we happen to be living. I can chime in. Um, <clears throat> similarly, also thinking a lot about digital humanities in this moment. Uh, myself and my co-founder uh, working on a an archive that I don't think that we would have worked on with such fervor that we are now um, if it wasn't for this moment and trying to preserve um, and document the stories of contemporary women of color artists um, and art workers. Um, but to, you know, what's been said here always with caution, right? Like thinking about surveillance, thinking about um, points of access. Um, you know, my work is deeply rooted in thinking about Publics and and justice for publics and the layers within that right of you know race gender um, class um, and so it's never um, it's never easy you know there's no there's no whole geography right that's just free <laughs> especially for folks of color and so you know whether that's in the digital or you know IRL that um, we're always kind of moving with a certain kind of caution to think through um, as much as this moment present certain possibilities. Um, we recognize that, you know, those possibilities can be um, taken away from us, can be, um, you know, turned um, at any moment um, as, you know, we, we surface to the mainstream. And so um, those, are, those are things that are both exciting, but also, of course, frightening to some extent. Um, but I do think that within this moment, um, I can appreciate the kind of hybridity that I'm forced to kind of work in. Um, and so I've worked in digital, I've worked in publics. Um, and so bridging those together and trying to create a more, um, I guess, full degree for people to kind of think through art um, and access art and make those, those kinds of narratives public is something that um, I hesitate to say that I'm excited about, but um, it's work that I feel good about doing in this moment. Um, I would say for me, in terms of re-envisioning what I do, um, it's been, it was definitely a challenge as a museum educator to figure out how I can connect with audiences um, outside the museum. Um, I don't, I hadn't had a lot of experience um, in the digital realm teaching, um, more face-to-face. -face. So I, you know, I really had no idea what would happen. Um, and I really use this opportunity to connect with the group, the group that I mainly work with at the museum, Stay Gold, which is the intergenerational queer um, arts group, and also our summer camp, which we do an installation summer camp and it's very hands-on. And so I had to think about how to offer a summer camp um, without that. Um, and so pivoting to the digital, um, while it was a challenge, it really highlighted for me that in what interests me about art education is not the skill building aspect. Um, it's the dialogue and it's using art as a tool to affect change or to you know, spark moments of like, where people have realizations or they have moments, you know, where they think differently about something, um, which is one of the, my favorite things about teaching. Um, and one of the coolest things for me that came out of teaching um, digitally was how intimate, how much more intimate it felt um, and how much more it cultivated vulnerability um, and I think just the face to face, you know, when we're in a space together, we kind of walk around and talk to each other. And this online format really forces us to be face to face, quote in quotes, you know. Um, and so we're each paying attention to who's speaking. And it's just a really different way of practicing care and attention to one another. Um, and it's been a really amazing transformational experience in terms of how I teach and what I, just what I place emphasis on. Um, and also, you know, there's some obvious things I think like access, it, it offers more access, but also can offer less access to some. 
So there's those unique challenges. Um, but for me, the main thing was it allowed me to stay connected with participants that experience higher rates of loneliness and are super isolated during this pandemic. Um, I think just on the surface, that's the biggest um, benefit was just being able to connect every week um, and have you know that moment to just to check in and be there. So thanks. Thank you all. Um, and in thinking about uh, some of the things that you all have brought up, um, sort of harnessing um, uh, the collective, uh, and maybe you've implied that and, and not um, explicitly stated that, um, but I think of your words, um, like how do we preserve the networks is the, the question that uh, Raven posed. Um, and these networks have always been here. Um, and so I'm wondering um, your thoughts on how your work uh, has, um, has harnessed uh, this notion of the collective, you know, and how the collective, um, you know, might uh, propel us uh, forward. Um, I, I'm not sure how um, our, our panelists today were, were gathered, you know, the decision of making to gather uh, this group um, of thinkers together, but I suspect that there is an intergenerational, you know, as Eli's research is uh, connected to, there is an intergenerational um, um, collective here. And so I, I'm curious about how you all think about uh, the notion of the collective and how that informs your work and um, how your work also harnesses that. Um, I personally feel like in order to move forward, there has to be an acknowledgement of like generational difference. Um, I just strongly believe that to like heal and, and grow, uh, we need to stop passing on generational trauma and have real conversations about the real issues and the real differences between generations. Um, just to create a ground for a foundation for understanding um, of where people came from, what they faced and experienced, and how it's so different now. And, you know, just the context of each person's life, I think, is so important because it's difficult for a young person, I think, to understand why an older person might feel the way they do about whatever particular issue because they have no uh, where they're coming from um, in their lives. And I've witnessed it. Um, so I just, I strongly believe that moving forward, if we're going to move forward um, with all the information that we could possibly have, that feels like a really important component. I think that's been missing in a lot of ways. Um, and there was one other thing I was gonna say about that. Um, Maybe it'll come back to me. I'll hop in there. Um, part of my work, um, and, and this address is actually one one or more of the questions that have been posed in the chat window, um, uh, deal with this this notion of preservation and exposing or introducing uh, students or even uh, uh, colleagues on new ways that we're able to preserve the digital stories or the stories of, um, uh, of, of, of a community, of ancestors, of relatives. Um, and and I, I always like to, to, to put it in this way, whereby um, instead of looking at, at, at past ways that we've been able to either document, record, or archive uh, either stories of, of these communities, um, I think it's important to at least be aware of the ways that, that we're able to experience those stories a little bit differently. Uh, for instance, I don't know how many of you have seen the, um, uh, the, the television series Watchmen, uh, one of my favorites, uh, Watchmen, but there's a scene in there where, uh, where, where the main character takes a little acorn and puts it in a device and then and then a 3d version of a relative materializes um, we can do that now and so when I think about the ways that we're able to uh, to document a story 
that future generations can then experience through that documentation this younger generation is hearing uh, some of the trauma some of the stories and experiences of a community that may help with self-healing that may help them understand that they're not the only ones going through whatever it is they're going through because now they're able to not only through the technology help document someone else's story but maybe relate to it in some way and so there's that 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 sort of um uh, uh, self-healing and in some ways built into this this whole introductory uh, introduction to these modern technologies and ways to uh, to document the digital stories or the stories of a community. Yes, and that made me remember the one last thing was, you know, when we lose our older generations, we're losing histories that are more real than what we're taught. So I feel like that is really a key part. Um, yeah, when I think about that question of the collective and hearing um, both Eli and Dr. Carter's responses, um, it just makes me think of citation and which is how I think about my work um, holistically. And so as a Black woman, as um, someone who does PLC-centered work, um, I'm always thinking about the, cite the citation, the footnote, um, who are we charting? And so whether that is you know, creating a public program alongside an institution or independently, um, there's a kind of naming that's being done, right? Like I'm bringing in folks of color um, as a way of naming them and um, documenting their presence in a space, right? And I'm doing this work as a way to name the community they're coming from and name the community that we're working within. Um, and so, um, I mean, even if you go to our website, like we, we cite the thinkers that inform every aspect of our work because we see ourselves as building right on a, a type of knowledge, working within a, an ecosystem, um, and of course, just trying to charter a kind of future, which is what we're talking about when we talk about the collective, right? Um, and so even in doing this work, I'm very much invested in making sure we're working alongside, you know, other collectives and other organizations because, um, and that's, you know, across spectrums, um, you know, whether it's libraries, whether it's um, archives, um, and the list can go on because for me, the philosophy is that we're all doing this work, but we might use a different kind of vernacular. Um, and so, again, that citation becomes so important because even though you see your work in one type of um, medium, uh, we're all citing, you know, the same people. And so what does that mean when we go back to the citation and we can see that you know, we're all building um, towards the same kind of future, but we're doing it in different areas. And so again, that collective becomes so much stronger when we can recognize, um, you know, who was before us as what's being said, um, so that we can build a kind of collective future that is together. Because um, if that's the point of our work individually, why aren't we all also in conversation with one another? Um, to me, um, my cl my collective is not just with the art field because of the department that I'm working in is in curriculum pedagogy, so it's not under the school of arts or the big art. Yeah, so um, I got a uh, chance. This I I really value this um, chance that I have is I am able to. Um, I am working with the professors in uh, science education, in technology education. They are all there and I can just walk to their office door and start our conversation. So I, when people are talking about STEAM, STEM, uh, all this kind of a, um, collaboration, um, I would say as art educators, we really need to uh, try to get get ourselves up and then try to let people know what we are really doing. Um, because in this art world, we all know what we are doing and we love our work and we know the importance of that. But even till now, just like two years ago, I went to one of my colleagues, uh, she is from science education. And I tell her, I say, how about let's work together? And she was saying, yeah, we can do this and that. And then finally your art student can just come and decorate the work and uh, make a poster. That was the time that I was really like, okay, I need to explain this to you. Art education is not just like this. So um, uh, when I'm thinking about art, and collaborative with other fields, I really think we got this responsibility to be the lead. We are not just 
be part of them. So when I'm thinking about STEAM, I say no, A should be at the upfront because art is the vision. Art is the way of looking at the world differently and we need that. So uh, that's why I, I think I, I, I'm still working with my colleague and I'm working with my technology colleagues too. So we, when we are together, they will say, they will think I have very weird ideas that they will never have. And uh, I'm kind of proud of that. And uh, I say this is because of my art background. So I would say um, art people, we shouldn't be the quiet one. We shouldn't be the introverted one. We should be the vocal one. We should get out of there and then tell people what we are doing, and uh, how we can make it better. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all um, for, for your comments. Um, this is so rich. I have so many questions and I know that I can only get just a few more in. Um, but uh, Eli mentioned earlier, um, you know, sort of shifting, um, shifting away from just a skills-based practice, um, which, you know, uh, sort of connects to Dr. Han, what you were mentioning that art education is beyond making posters. Uh, and so, I'm wondering um, what, what might be the critical shifts? Um, it seems that artists, you know, art education, art educators, you know, those of us connected to the world of uh, the visual, um, do we need to somehow um, shift the language? Um, how do we re-envision who we are and how others uh, perceive what it is that we do? Um, you know, each, each of your work, as I was uh, researching each of you, um, deploys the imagination in some way. It's obvious to me, and I'm sure it's obvious to others uh, who are joining us this morning, and so I'm wondering um, what your thoughts on um, that might be, how we might um, collect others or gather up others as, as we see it's important uh, to do that to, um, you know, represent ourselves. Well, I think part of that, and in fact, most of that is is through collaboration. Uh, and through collaboration, you get increased exposure. Um, and I can't speak from the arts world, but I can speak from the humanities world. One of the um, uh, the the collaborations that I'm currently involved in is uh, almost a purely science based project, and it's one that um, actually is in Harlem, New York, uh, Ravan, uh, and uh, we're we're looking at, at at working with a number of housing units and installing these very high speed uh, computing networks so that those without internet connectivity can have it, right? Uh, we're working with our optical sciences at here and at Columbia University. I mean, it's a purely scientific thing, but then one of the PIs said, well, look, I think we need to incorporate the humanities here. And he pulled uh, uh, the, the Center for Digital Humanities into that project and not many others understood. I got it immediately like you, Dr. Wilson, uh, whereby in order for those that, that are gonna make access or, or hopefully have access to this network, they have to see themselves using that network. They have to see how they'll use it not just for productivity purposes but also for cultural heritage purposes for creative purposes for ways that that might uh, that that might uh, uh, help them tell their own stories very differently so when i think about the ways that humanities and the arts need to be front and center like uh, you said dr han it's through those kinds of unusual or non-traditional collaborations and then people will begin to see the importance of the arts because we'll be at the table and helping to, to direct the focus or, or the direction of the research as opposed to simply benefiting from the research that's already been done. Yes, and I, I would add to collaboration across disciplines. Um, you know, I think the interdisciplinary or, you know, just the interdisciplinary aspect is super important, I think. Um, but also, you know, when we look at just the evolution of art and art education and then where we are right now. If you, if you just Google anything, you can find out how to make and do anything online. There's a lesson for anything you want to do. 
And one of the things I learned through being an art, a museum educator is that I do not want to duplicate what already exists in my community. I'm not here to compete with what other people are already offering. And so that has forced me to think of how to create unique uh, things to offer. Um, and I think that just that shift of, you know, the, the, there's multiple places teaching drawing or there's multiple places teaching skill building. Why would I do that? And not, it's not that simple. I recognize your question is much larger than that, but there's also, I learned how much value there is in using what artists of today are, make, are making with and about as a tool to then do, create more um, or have participants work through those issues in whatever mediums they you know, feel speak to what they're talking about. Um, I think that by doing is the, is the only way. Um, by doing differently and illustrating the how successful or how impactful that can be. Um, I mean, when I look back on other, how things have evolved, I just think that's how, you know, I don't, I wish there was like a way we could all collectively make a statement. <laughs> this isn't working. We need to like, you know, stop this sort of um, called older ways of doing things. Um, and I think we're, you're right. I think we're there right now. We're at this like moment of, of things are pivoting and there's like pushback um, from people who want to continue doing it in the way they've been doing it. It doesn't quite work that way anymore. Um, I don't remember the, the full question, but I've held on to this poster comment um, and some things that were said earlier. So there's something I think about a lot um, being in the arts um, and working in community. Um, I would, or I'll, I'll back up even further. I'm also thinking about how um, in this moment, you know, who do we see are the first people to go? Are our educators? Um, what do we see as the first thing to go in our education scene, system, the arts, right? Um, and so for me, and I think to what's been said already is how do we, how do we get more art educators? How do we get more humanist folks in these, these spaces of leadership? Um, is something that I think about a lot. Um, I would love to see folks occupying these spaces on city councils, um, um, just as in real seats of power, um, to be able to speak to, um, again, the human aspect of just living in everyday life, right? I think we, most of us have, you know, either in our own lives or on the job, have had to experience someone making decisions about them who've never done a day's work or experienced the kind of work that they do. And so, you know, to Dr. Carter's point, you know, you can build this whole system, but if the people in the building don't know how to use it, <laughs> it was for nothing, <laughs> you know, like now you have these fancy wires going through this building and everybody is still trying to figure out how to log on or, you know, I think about a Whole Foods, right? Like everything is technology based, but if you're in a community that is essentially um, what likes to be coined as a food desert, but is really food genocide, you know, you're walking around aimlessly with a car that, or you might not even have a car, right? But you don't know how to use these buttons. You don't know how to use these systems. And so I think, you know, in this larger moment, thinking about who has been in charge has been, you know, become more visible of how do we then reposition folks. And, you know, we see within our education, the way that our educators are often infantilized. They're often stripped of the way that their work thinks about pedagogy, the way that they are thinking strategically, right, about access and bringing folks um, into the fold and um, community. And so how do we then shift, right? And I mean, this goes for teachers, we see this, right? Like they're underpaid. So how do we then shift the people who are most important in our society, most essential to our work and our living um, that make all of these things possible? And so, I mean, that's of course, is like an even bigger question and like, where do we even start to solve that? But those are the kind of things that I'm thinking about of well, if we know it doesn't work within the institution, how do we then take those networks um, and work outside of the institutions? Um, and so I'm always following artists in the way that they are mutual aid caregivers, the way that they are sources of knowledge and, you know, have seized these moments to turn their studios into um, kitchens and things of that nature to provide mutual aid to their communities. And so how do we continue to replicate those models instead of 
um, getting complacent once the world turns to some form of normalcy, right? Um, and returning back to those old ways that weren't working for us in the first place. Um, to me, I think uh, what people, they actually, they know how important the visual is influencing us, especially for those who are on the social media and we are using the images. We are, we know if we don't post a photo next to our picture, uh, the text, no one is going to read it. So we know that and everyone knows that, but why the, uh, the gap between art and visual culture is so huge? I think this is something very important for us as an art educator to try to bring people into the contemporary art or gallery or into any art gallery museum for them to experience that, to re-see that, reopen their eyes that they are there. And this is the way how we can see the world differently. It's not just by taking a snapshot of our daily life, but making the connection for people, for them to know art is everywhere, yes, but how you use the art mind to think about the world, it can be very differently. So that's maybe the, another way to help people to think the importance of art and art education. Uh, of course, there is no more uh, academic ways so that's like, presenting at the uh, IST conferences or presenting at uh, the ARA conferences that's not in art education group and then publications in different uh, journals and books and then that's focusing on the art education to help force people to see that the importance of art education. But yeah, I will say if we can, everyone can bring one or two friends just to the art gallery who have no relation to art education or art. Just bring them in, your parents, your friends, just bring them into the art gallery music and have them to experience, discuss with them, help them, help them to see art because they might need someone to open the door so they will be able to see that. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Han, Raven, um, Dr. Carter, Eli. Um, I think, it, you know, your, your point, Dr. Han, of, um, you know, taking, physically taking somebody by the hand or even, you know, conceptually um, <laughs> guiding them. We, we, um, we um, emphasize uh, the importance of models. Um, folks who are modeling things, which sort of um, brings me back around to uh, something I think each of you have mentioned, which is access. Um, you know, I mentioned earlier that um, this pandemic uh, has revealed to us, you know, many of the fissures in the systems that we operate in, the ecosystems that we operate in. And so I can also tie this to Raven, what you mentioned earlier about uh, citational practices and whose voices um, have not been amplified uh, sort of in, in our ecosystem across all domains, you know, which connects to Dr. Carter's, you know, this human element. Um, and uh, I, I'm wondering, and I'll probably have to leave you all with this thought or this question, uh, because I know that there are many questions um, from our participants, um, is that how, how can we model um, best practices, um, uh, humane practices even? Um, and when does um, justice-oriented work become a performance rather than, um, you know, some other intention? I think in, in exposing, you know, sort of the cracks, um, there, there are people from different generations who have lived through uh, turbulent moments very similar to this. I think of my father who grew up in Jim Crow, Alabama in the 50s and 60s, who are quite cynical when, when they see a collective performance um, of justice, you know, when it seems trendy to do so. And so this, this goes back to this notion of access who, um, I think, um, I 
it might have been not sure which one of you mentioned it. I'm taking notes. Um, like who who has who has always had access to spaces, you know, and what does that mean um, moving forward when we're thinking about equity oriented measures or justice oriented measures and how might we not repeat um, what I call the everyday violences on minoritized communities who have always experienced um, inequity differently. Okay, so yeah, it's yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, and I, there's no one answer to, of course. And 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 I think that at a uh, as a faculty member at a predominantly white institution, uh, we 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 uh we can respond to that on so many different levels. Number one, uh, you know, we're of course exposing a number of students who have probably had very little, if any, uh, exposure to anything diverse or very much diversity education. Uh, anything dealing with um uh with uh, uh anything dealing with with uh, uh, social justice um, uh, or very little of that. We have to expose them to that first um, and, and, and re-educate in many ways uh, some of the, the ways that, 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 that the holes have been uh, left in, in their previous uh, educational exposure. Um, and that doesn't, I don't know, if, I don't think that really comes through performance. Um, I think that that comes through exposure. It comes through uh, the, our modeling the, uh, the, the research projects in which we as faculty members then have an opportunity to participate in, whether it be ones in the community, and we pull students into that so they can see how to work with community groups, how to focus on the community groups and let them be the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the lead in whatever it is that we might happen to be working with them on, as opposed to coming in as, say, the saviors or what have you. And by doing that at a predominantly white institution, what I guess part of my hope is, is that those students will then remember that experience. And as they then move into perhaps positions of power or, or whatever it is that, that their next steps are, that they'll remember that as they then begin to empower those communities around them because they'll have more more information in which to work with as opposed to going into various positions from a silo in which they have no understanding cultural understanding of those that they're working with or working for or even the constituencies that they're that their company happens to be uh, uh, trying to gain access to thank you dr carter and, and uh, raven or eli or Dr. Hahn, if you have thoughts about this. Uh, I just want to say that Raven, I really like your shirt. Always black, never sorry. I think if I'm wearing a shirt similar to that, it will be always yellow, always sorry. <laughs> because that will be the Asian stereotyping, how people look at us, how people see us. Um, working on predominantly white institution as a um, yeah, minority faculty at this institution. I would say, yes, I got a lot of attention from my department and I got a lot of support. However, the institution does have its own problems and then this is very hard to overcome. I, um, they are, they, I, I would say that's, that's, that's the reason why I leaning towards to go more research into the culture studies, um, because I personally, to me, a lot of things is not only about race, not only about gender, not only about your anything, even my age, how I look, I, I'm actually not that young, but everyone think I am very young. I don't understand why. But anyways, uh, I, I feel like a lot of things is because of we don't understand each other. And uh, we, how are we trying to really understand each other? And how are we going to provide the equal opportunities to, to each other? That's something is very, very important. Um, we, we should be putting our focus on. I, the reason I don't want to put uh, the focus on the race is because as Asian people think we should be quiet, we should not be loud, um, we should be always sorry <laughs> part. Um, uh, so I, when there was a person, they, he told me that just be an Asian woman, I was shocked. I, I, because in my mind, I don't understand what the Asian woman really means. 
But when I look around, I see, oh, okay, I kind of guessing what you mean that you want me to be just an Asian woman. Um, oh, okay, then. But the thing is, what, uh, where I'm going with this is I, I feel like, um, yes, we, we have gap, we have divide. Uh, how are we going to, is that a way that we can fill the ga gaps? If there is a way that we can build a bridge, I think it's all not that easy, but if we can, if we can, through art, we can help people to have a more open mind and to have the open mind to see something that they might never see before, to try to imagine things can be done differently, try to think about the world from different perspective the world view is different. So maybe through that, through art, we can achieve that. And maybe that's why I go back to my very, very first that why I'm thinking about the humanity is very important today is because I really think if we can, through art, we can help people to see the world um, with a more open mind and they might be able to not cross the bridge. They don't need to come to this side. No, not filling the gap. No, they don't need to come to this side because if they never been on this land, they will never know. But if they can just have an open mind, maybe, maybe they can try to be understanding. Thank you. I'll just add that this is something that I struggle a lot with, um, just personally and as an educator, and also working in an institution sort of grounded in like colonial ideas, um, you know, museums, um, but also higher education. Um, and so I, I just, I think about this a lot and the way that I, in this moment, have been able to sort of work is try to, and I know this is sort of a buzzword right now, but decenter myself um, from the process within education and work with the participants. Like I, tr I think fo staying focused on um, creating spaces um, for others to have experiences and voice within art, um, within the larger art conversation. And so through programming, just working with participants to um provide windows into like new like other experiences and other ways of seeing the world and also challenging the institution that i work at um and you know speaking up when something feels wrong or off um which can be a challenge but um yeah it's it's something that i feel like i'm in and i'm in the process and ongoing and trying to figure out my role and how to best um, work towards uh, racial justice. Yeah, I'll just quickly say, I mean, one echoing all the sentiments that have been said. Um, and I think what's sticking out for me is thinking about this point of performativity. Um, and so, you know, of course, in this moment, seeing all of the apologies and the we stand with rolling in, right, one after another, um, which of course, you know, didn't exist only a few months ago. Um, and so I think, you know, nothing is promised. I certainly lost faith in institutions and structures a long time ago, but I do think the, I think, I do think that this particular moment, right, has stripped us of so much that, um, it's one of those things where it feels like there's nothing else to really lose. Um, and so I'm seeing the way that, you know, again, I'm thinking about the artists, um, uh, educators, the way that we've been kind of squeezed within this museum structure, right? Like, the, um, you know, you're either going to have your job or you're not. And so it's kind of like, there's really not much else you can really take from me at this point. And so I think that is the kind of um, energy that I'm hoping to continue to, to sustain and like nurture in this moment, because I think um, what I'm seeing is the way that, you know, those apologies that we got um, aren't being allowed to just um, exist, right? They're, they're constantly being challenged and questioned. Um, 
and you know and that's not without risk like I'm seeing artists and and cultural workers who are making those challenges and putting themselves on the line um, to call out these institutions and call out this moment. Um, and so I think, you know, going back to that, that question of performativity, I think that's where really, again, the collectivity, um, our care networks, um, and rather than ally, right, our, our accomplices are really, really crucial in this moment um, of supporting one another and supporting artists because um, you know, as there's this despised in this culture, oftentimes um, they're the most vulnerable, um, but yet their work is so essential to our imagination and to our livelihoods. And so, um, you know, just trying to step in where you can, if you have that leverage or if you have that ability to support, I think now is the time to really think about where within your position. Um, what I like to say is like doing kind of a doula work, um, like where can you be a doula in, in your work? Um, whatever that may be, and provide care um, to those who are vulnerable in our in our society. Absolutely, and I think that um, you know sort of brings us full circle um, back to the importance of um, uh, intergenerational work um, and what happens when um, uh, generations um, die, uh, and how uh, important it is. Uh, to sort of harness what's already been done, you know, the networks that have already existed. Uh, thank you all so much. Um, I know that we um, would like to leave time for participant questions. And so I'm going to ask uh, the organizers uh, whether or not they would like to uh, moderate chat questions or if you would like for me to. I can do that. Um, so hello everyone. Uh, my name is Amber Coleman and I'm a doctoral student in art and visual culture here at the University of Arizona. And I wanna thank all of our speakers today as well as our moderator for participating in such an engaging conversation. Um, so this conversation helps us to bridge into a little bit more conversation through our question and answer session. Um, where the audience can ask our keynote speakers and moderator further questions. Um, you can write your questions in the chat and I will ask them aloud um, with the remaining time that we have available. And there's a couple of questions already there, so I will start with those. Okay. Um, so one of our questions comes from one of my fellow co-organizers for Eli um, from Gia Del Pino. Um, you say you strive to create original workshops and lessons instead of replicating lesson plans that can be found online. Can you share a few examples of workshops you've created and conducted at MOCA? Sure. Um, the main one that comes to mind is School of Drag. Um, I think one of the things that I've realized through educating both in higher education and in museum education is the importance of like each individual student <clears throat> and highlighting their experiences and their positionalities and allowing them to sort of discover themselves through art. Um, it took me a while to get there, but that's eventually where I'm, I am at this moment. And so School of Drag is a program that it offers participants to um, explore for gender performance. Um, so we bring in um, a drag group that facilitates and teaches, you know, character development and costume and makeup and music and character creation and choreography. And they do a huge showcase at the end. But what's really interesting is that, and this is similar with other uh, programs that I do, or even in a regular sort of classroom environment, um, is finding entry points within individual identities to engage with art on a, on a larger scale. So when you, you know, when we think about different kinds of people, there's usually like this sort of singular identity um, that we label them. And so this program really offers to think about all the sort of fragments of our identities and how sometimes they're contradictory um, and 
it really allows participants to consider all those aspects of themselves um, and create a character based on whichever one they want to highlight. Um, and I think that art, particularly contemporary art right now, is a really great um, entry point for that because there's so many different concepts and mediums and um, issues explored that there's sort of something for everyone in a way. Um, yeah, so I would say School of Drag is a really good example of just trying to offer something that maybe people want, but um, it's just not available to them. You know, when you think about drag, it's typically, typically happens in bars, but there are so many youth interested in drag and they cannot go to bars and there's no way to learn about it um, in, a, in a mediated environment. So they're either online, sort of absorbing the information, looking at tutorials and things like that. But this, I think, just provides uh, a deeper engagement with both drag history, culture, and contemporary art in a, in a larger, on a larger scale. Thank you for sharing that, Eli. Um, we have another question from Lynn Robinson. Um, do any of the speakers or folks in attendance now working in the digital realm find the technology limiting in terms of what is available to your institution or the learning curve that, curve that comes with it? Yes and yes, <laughs> mostly because of cost and access. Uh, you know, the most recent technologies are always going to be way, way too expensive. Uh, we're working with one technology now that's just insanely expensive. It's $7,000 a month uh, just for part of it, and that's not to us, but, but that's what they charge commercially. So you can imagine that putting that technology into the hands of, the, of, of underserved communities is, is next to impossible. Uh, so that's one thing. Uh, but also um, uh, uh, access with regards to uh, even students in the classroom, uh, you know, what has come through those cracks, Dr. Wilson, is, uh, you know, all the fissures that, that relate to uh, either slow internet, congested internet, uh, no internet at all at home, uh, because everybody's at home, right? Uh, but then when you think about even the lack of it also maybe not necessarily that great cell phone speed uh, if it's uh, if that's the only level of access. So uh, access has been so very important with regards to this, uh, this conversation, I think. Yes, the answer is yes and yes as well. Um, I'm a joint fellow at MoMA and Studio Museum. So right there, that speaks to very different points of access between two um, preeminent institutions, but very different in who they serve um, and just the body of the institutions themselves. Um, and so while at Studio Museum, uh, this particular moment was the first time we created a born digital program. Um, and just thinking about the infrastructure of exactly Dr. Carter, um, of what that means, um, you know, internally, um, you know, and then before that I came from the Smithsonian African American Museum. And so I was privileged to see what it looks like when you have a completely outfitted, um, you know, tech team versus coming to Studio Museum where it's like, that person who fixes your computer is not the same person who also makes sure that programming can happen online. Um, and so those are the kind of realities that are happening on the back end of museums of um, not really being outfitted to have um, fully digital programming that we're facing. And of course, the costs that are, you know, associated with that is also um, another thing because that means hiring, that means tools, um, and then also thinking about audience. And so those audiences are going to be very different from who you serve in person. And, you know, even just thinking about the fact that a program that you created to be in person, it's going to be a completely different program um, online, you know, I mean, speaking about a conference, right? And so, you know, when you're used to creating a kind of a level of intimacy that relies on the in person, how do you then recreate that kind of intimacy? in the digital world is a totally different ball game. Uh, I do have some thoughts about this, but um, from a different perspective that when I'm thinking about technology for education, to me, what is most important things is the how many people can is able to use that? Um, maybe that's the, also the reason why I'm not going to the VR and AR that 
rashly because I know this is not for everyone yet. And maybe that's also the reason why I'm still staying in the virtual world. Um, maybe that's the reason why I left the Second Life and built my own open sim and uh, open to everyone to the world. So whoever, if you want to use the open sim for your teaching, learning, whatever, researching, just send me an email. I will give you a land for free because this is what I believe. Education should be free to everyone. Otherwise, it means to me, it doesn't mean anything. Okay. Um, I am paying for the uh, server. I, uh, thanks to my partner, he is a programmer. He built a world for me <laughs> for free. <laughs> but yeah, this is what I'm thinking is very important that the uh, availability that as an educator, as a researcher, I try my best. I find the technology that everyone can use. Uh, I hope, I hope I can find better resources for the future, and uh, I hope I can have some a team that will be able to. I hope I can get a big grant and then be able to build another uh, program for education during this kind of a time. Yeah. Thank you all for speaking on that. Um, another question by Jenna Green. How can we know which technologies are sustainable and can we know? Sustainability, that's, uh, that's something that I've been grappling with for a while. And I think that one of the more important things is to uh, look at the technology as a whole and not necessarily the, the tool that's making use of that technology or the application. So for instance, um, uh, looking at augmented reality, understanding what that is, uh, as opposed to looking at simply Snapchat or Pokemon Go or any of the individual applications, because those are going to come and go. The technology is going to continue to evolve, whether it be immersive technologies, VR, AR, XR, those are not going to go away um, because they're just going to in, in, be enhanced with regards to increased graphics, increased bandwidth, um, and lowering costs. Um, so learning and understanding those larger concepts I think will be more beneficial than trying to learn an app and then be disappointed when it goes away or doesn't work with the next operating system, which we always see happens. Thank you for answering that, Dr. Carter. Um, I believe those are all of our questions. Dr. Wilson, I don't know if you want to follow up with any other additional questions that you might have had? Let's see, I do, there was one question that, oh, uh, so Chris Omni, uh, and I think this might have been directed to um, Dr. Carter. Um, can you speak to how self-care and self-preservation feeds into Afrofuturism? Yeah, I saw a few of those questions from Chris. Thank you very much for asking those. Um, uh, yeah, self-preservation <clears throat> is so very important. Um, I, 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 I'm privileged enough to have access to several different kinds of VR headsets, and I've seen some of the possibilities with regards to being able to put on a headset and, and going into a virtual environment that literally does, through various visuals and audio, calm you down if you had a rough day or it puts you into a state, right? And so to, to have access to that is something that unfortunately not everybody has. And so Chris, another one of your questions is how do we deal with that lack of access? Well, uh, once again, that's gonna be through grants, it's gonna be through philanthropy, it's gonna be through our taking on uh, expenses like uh, Dr. Han is doing with regards to the open SEM. It's regards to, you know, um, when you're in a position, uh, being able to uh, expend the resources to those who are underserved, um, like the center does with regards to working with Dunbar or with uh, Color Girls Museum of, of, of Philadelphia or even with groups in Harlem. So, so I think that that part is important. Um, and I really do believe that there are really some interesting ways that uh, through, uh, through self-care, we can take advantage of some of the more recent technologies. I mean, look at the um, 
uh, the explosion of um, of of uh, online uh, therapy uh, because people can't get out. Well, we can still video conferencing, and the next version of that is uh, is is the the sort of therapy that that takes advantage of some of the volumetric stuff that I was telling you about. So you can you can project your image or vice versa into the space of someone else, uh, which takes that to an entirely new level, I think. Thank you, Dr. Carter, for speaking on that. And I apologize, Chris, for missing your question. I also see you had another question. Is it a must to know where we are going? How does flow factor into our being if we know? Oh, I would like to respond to that question. Thank you, Amber. Um, to me, we, yeah, we can walk blindly just going forward. We can walk, but it would be nice for us to be able to know where we are going. Um, to me, the easier way, I guess, is to find a problem in the current in space and time. And from here, we see what we would like to see a better world. And how will the better world look like in the future? That's why I think the humanity, that, that's why I'm going back to the humanity, the ethic, the humanity is a very important part. I don't know if anyone see the social dilemma, that documentary is pretty scary. If you never got a chance to see that, uh, I don't think any social media will try to promote that. So yeah, if you never got a chance to see that, uh, take a look how we are, um, how we are changed by the social media, by the AI software behind it, and how the world is going to out of control. Of course, it's not that scary. As human beings, we, we should be able to control that. We should be able to find a way to solve the problems. But um, that's why I'm going back to uh, my ver the, the question is, uh, do we really need to know where is the future? No, we will never be able to know. But if we can envision, if we cannot envision, then yes, we can find a problem from here. And then from here, we can move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Han, for answering that. Um, I believe that those are all of the questions. So, um, that's everything. I will start with our, we'll end with our closing remarks for this session. So as our very own Dr. Amy Cray has said, different conceptions of the future inform art curriculum, but the reverse is also true. Artistic and creative activity are necessary for imagining and shaping a sustainable future. In closing, we hope that this conversation will prompt many more conversations about the future of our education as we continue to live in such uncertain times. As you can see here, for your reference, the full symposium schedule can be found on our website at emergingconversations.weebly.com. First, I would like to thank my fellow co-organizers, Gia Del Pino, Keely Kazira, Lucy Mugambi, Andrew Tergarden and Rachel Zollinger for creating such an amazing event and gathering. We would like to thank the Art and Visual Culture Education Department at the University of Arizona for their continued support. Finally, we would like to thank the University of Arizona College of Fine Arts Small Grant Program and the Graduate and Professional Student Council Professional Opportunities Development Grant Program for the support for this event. This conversation will be followed by a 10 minute break, which will be followed by our program of 10 live sessions, which range a variety of topics related to the arts and education. These topics include, but are not limited to disability and art classrooms, virtual learning, peaceful protests, border monuments and museum education. Each session will be followed by a 10 minute break. Following these sessions, we will host a 30 minute happy hour for those who are interested and virtually mingling and networking. On our website, you will also find a program for today's event with information about the keynote speakers, presenters and presentations, as well as how to access sessions and additional resources provided by the speakers related to today's conversation. Please remember that there are also four pre-recorded sessions available 
through our Emerging Conversations YouTube channel, and each of the live Zoom sessions are being recorded for the audience to access after today via our YouTube channel. We thank you all for attending and hope you enjoy today's symposium. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate it. Yeah.